then the tenth one you can see stated again in vast might of the Trinity prayed to, believing on a threeness, confessing a oneness, meeting the Creator. So that's the refrain, and that's the, you might say, the Trinitarian ethos of all of Tatis ministry. So a truly orthodox uh, approach. Now remember, back in the 5th century, 4th and 5th <coughs> century, there was no difference east and west between the orthodox ethos of the Catholic Church. The whole Catholic Church was orthodox. So they didn't have distinguish between the two. On another note, I'm, I'm reading the Acts of the Council of Calcadon right now, which took place right about the time of Patrick, <coughs> just before Patrick's uh, repose. That took place 10 years before his <laughs> repose, so it's the same era. And in there, the, the word Orthodox and Catholic are used interchangeably, so we don't make any distinction in that early era of our church. Okay. So, maybe you're familiar with a popular image of the Trinity of Catholic. Did anybody mention that? Yeah, the three leaf clover. Um, I have a little coffee mug. Um, um, do, do any of you know the cartoonist uh, Gary Larson? Mm -hmm. Gary Larson? Okay, okay well, the, the mug I have shows a bunch of. Um, Four leaf clovers walking around like in the green of city, you know, the city. And there was one of them sitting on the ground holding out a tin cup begging. He was a three leaf clover. <laughs> <laughs> and it says, down on his luck. As much as Johnny's pun. <laughs> I know. But it's a coffee cup I have. Anyway, so the three-leaf clover, he, this, is, this is Patrick's action-oriented theology. Rather than speculate using fancy words in theology, he just basically pick a, he'd pick a common clover and show the people, see, this is, this is our God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but one. It's one leaf, right? Mm -hmm. So what could be more helpful than that? Mm. So that's his whole approach. All right. Roman numeral two follows Roman numeral three and so on. Each of those segments follows and can be capitulated with one word. So I'm going to help you with that so we can see what this whole uh, breastplate uh, is doing. The second part is the economy. So we started with the Trinity and then we moved to the economy. Before we go much further, though, we probably ought to stress that this 
naming of it as a lorica or a breastplate is based on certain scriptural precedents. Maybe we should make that more clear. Anybody see where this comes from? Why would we want such a thing? Ephesians talks about putting on the armor of God. So good. It's the armor of God. Ephesians 6, uh, verse 10 and following, put on the breastplate of righteousness. And in another place, St. Paul talks about uh, righteousness as being Christ himself. He is our righteousness. So this is, this is basically putting on a Christian, is clothing ourselves with Christ, putting him on. So the economy. <coughs> now, just keeping it at that level would be still somewhat theoretical, but now we move to real connections here. The third one. What could be summarized in your mind by this segment? All the witnesses? Pardon? The cloud of witnesses? Yes, good. This is getting at it. I've just put down the ranks of saints. Um, so there you have the ranks of our heavenly intercessors in all their different classes. Right? The might of the cherubim, the obedience of angels, the ministration <coughs> of the archangels, the hope of the resurrection through merits, the in prayers of patriarchs and predictions of prophets, and preachings of apostles and faiths of confessors, and innocence of holy virgins and deeds of good men. Okay. The word good men uh, uh, would cover all the uh, pious lay people, men and women. Okay, so that's a generic uh, plural. Okay, then the fourth one. What, what could we call that one? Creation. Exactly. So every, all of creation participates with us in the uh, invocation of Christ and the putting on of Christ. This is very important because the Irish have always cherished that deep connection with creation itself, with nature, and the physical world in their Christian experience. They've never sex, they've never had an urban kind of um, distance from the ground and from the earth. It's always been very close to them. Okay? So this preserves that for us. The might of heaven, the splendor of the sun, whiteness of snow, irresistibleness of fire, the swiftness of lightning, the speed of wind, absoluteness of the deep, earth stability, rocks, durability. Has anybody been to Ireland, by the way? Mm -hmm. uh, then we're all strangers to Ireland, even myself, but I've never been there. Um, we have one family in our parish that spent three years over there, and so they brought back lots of stories. There's uh, the Irish monastics would make dwellings in very inhospitable areas. There's, uh, in the west part of Ireland, there's um, a couple of places like that. You actually uh, they showed me pictures of it. It looks like, how could they possibly live there? There's no ground, there's no, it's just all rock. And they live there. So they must have gone to uh, collect what they could. Uh, very few trees, either. also, because they burned um, uh, peat moss. You know, that's how they, they use for fuel. So these are people who live on the edge of. of <coughs> civilization, so they're used to um, a hard way of life. Okay, what about number five? Fifth part one. Journey. Hmm? Traveling or journeying. Okay, journeying. I wrote experience because of the human life experience is a journey, of course, and there are elements of journey here. But if you look at it carefully, it involves all the senses as well. So we could put down um, experience, and we can add the word um, life's journey, um, and we can also add the word um, uh, the senses, you know, everything that I take in. So the sanctification of all of human experience, and the might of God for my piloting, the power of God for my stability, the wisdom of God for my guidance, eye of God for my foresight, ear of God for my hearing, word of God for my word, hand of God for my guard, half of God for my prevention, 
shield of God, my protection, host of God, my salvation. Against every demon snare, against all vices lure, against concupiscence, against ill wishes far and near. Okay, what is that against part? What, what he's warding. Okay, what are we warding off then? Let's be clear about what those are. A demon snare, so these are traps set by the invisible evil spirits. <coughs> uh, we say in the prayers of the church against um, uh, that we be protected from attacks, both visible and invisible. Okay, so the invisible attacks are handled here. Um, all vices lure, what's that? Yes, temptations, because what's a vice? It's a, a vice is a sinful but attractive thing that I, that I might want to participate in. And a lure means there's something pulling me. I mean, I want to do it, but um, the host of God for my salvation against all vices lure. So this means it's an interior struggle. What about concupiscence? Fancy word. Those of you who are raised in the King James Bible have probably recognized it, but the rest of you know. Um, it's the Latin word that equals the Greek word that's used in the New Testament, um, desire, um, fleshly desire. So it has to do with any fleshly-based desire. Um, this is a huge element, and it basically is um, expressed by our father, uh, Maximus, Professor, he's the one that's done the most explanation about this. That when Adam fell, he lost his uh, original place in communion with God, and he fell into sensuality. Uh, before the fall, there was no pain and no pleasure. No sensual pain and no sensual pleasure. Because the human, uh, the human being, Adam, was in complete communion with God, so he was he was in embodied light. So he was above sensual pain and pleasure. But with the loss of the light, his interior uh, soul went and looked out through the senses for fulfillment. There. And concupiscence is the captivation uh, to sensory pleasure, and thus it's corresponding the fear of sensory pain. By the way, in Lent, we're kind of reversing that a little bit. We, we willfully indulge in uh, the rejection. I put it funny that way. We indulge in the rejection of sensory pleasure so that we can once again put things, uh, cooperate with the grace of God, putting things in the back, uh, the correct um, order. OK. So, now we come to six. Now, how would we characterize this one? It's a very interesting section. I invoke all these forces between me and every savage force that may come upon me, body and soul, against incantations of false <coughs> prophets, against black laws of paganism, against false laws of heresy, against idolatry, against spells of women and smiths and druids, against all knowledge that should not be known. <coughs> yeah, definitely. Idols? Certainly that. But what does that mean? It's the fight. Hmm? It's the fight. I'm sorry? It's the fight. The fight? It's the battle. Yeah, that's the battle. It's a spiritual battle. But what... what some people don't really recognize that there actually is maleficent, you know, bad Spiritual warfare. things out there. They just say, oh, well, I, I don't believe in all that stuff, you know. Or they'll just say, you know, you shouldn't believe that. But there is real things here. Yeah. Spiritual warfare, spiritual struggle. Um, have any of you heard the book um, uh, Elder Paisios, um, the uh, guru? Yeah, the young man, uh, <coughs> the guru, the guru, and the elder. This is a very good uh, 
testimony to the, the reality of some of these maleficent forces and the struggle that one can um, be caught up in. Well, Patrick took this all very seriously. And of course, he was converting a people that was completely netted within that fearful and uh, destructive pagan network of uh, forces. So he had to invoke the grace of God at all times. We see, of course, elements of this in the New Testament. When Paul uh, went from one place to another. He had to meet up against paganism. Remember the snake that bit him and he shook it off and they thought he was a god. And, um, and St. Mark mentions in his gospel, um, you shall drink the deadly thing that will not hurt you. It refers to pagan uh, potions. Anything there that might strike you as odd? Notice black laws of paganism, but false laws of heresy. So the heretics, their laws are false. In other words, they promise a cure, but it doesn't work. The problem with heresy is it's the distillation of the truth by material that renders it not able to heal anymore. It's like taking the medicine and, and uh, neutralizing it, and it's no longer strong enough. So the church's uh, contest against heresy was very important for the salvation of all those who could deal with it. It wasn't just an argument over philosophy. It had everything to do with the actual substance of the gospel and whether it would cure or not. Look, if I have a bad, um, if I have a bad medicine and it doesn't work, then this can become very evident quickly. All right, so what would we say for uh, that, that uh, sixth section? What would we call that? Kind of negative. Mm -hmm. So various evils. Um, so this is remember this is the shield of Patrick, the breastplate. So this would be uh, against evil. Um, I'll just write against evil, huh? Against evil. Okay. What about seven? Short one. Christ, my guard to dig against poison, against burning, against drowning, against wounding, that there may come to be married. Mm -hmm. Accident. Yeah, so this would be accidents. Evil is one thing, but we also have accidents. Okay. Okay, eight. This is the most famous part, and usually gets cited by people when they're just giving a little bit. Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ under me, Christ over me, Christ to the right of me, Christ to the left of me, Christ in lying down, Christ in sitting, Christ in rising up. Hmm? Yes. Yeah, so the presence of Christ. What would we? Can you think of another another? Uh, uh, spiritual counsel that we get often about something similar to this? About the constant memory of Christ? Mm -hmm. what, what prayer do we are we frequently enjoined upon to pray? Jesus prayer. Yeah, the Jesus prayer. So this is Patrick's, I'm going to just write down Patrick's Jesus prayer. Alright? This is the constant putting on of Christ. Okay. All right, nine. Christ in all who may think of me. Christ in the mouth of all who may speak to me. Christ in the ear that may look on me. Christ in the e I'm sorry, the eye that may look on me. Christ in the ear that may hear me. This is the social aspect of uh, Patrick's breastplate. Social uh, kind of fellowship. So all his relationships are sanctified by his Christian faith so that every human being I see participates in it. And then the tenth is the reprise, the encore, once again calling on the name of the Holy Trinity and with the final little poetic addition, which is given in Latin there, uh, salvation is the Lord's, salvation is the Lord's, 
salvation is Christ's. May thy salvation, O Lord, be always with us. Okay? Encore with a prayer. Okay. That's the 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 Lorica of okay.